Hello there and welcome to Fire Engineering Blog Talk Radio in this episode of the Professional Volunteer Fire Department, the podcast that is dedicated to our great volunteer fire service and to the idea that true professionalism is never defined by a paycheck and developing, maintaining, and portraying and upholding a professional image is the duty and responsibility of all firefighters. Tom Merrill here. Thanks again for listening in. I truly appreciate it. And I am, you can't tell, but I am laid up here again in a cast. Um, My right ankle is in a cast. Good thing you can't see it. Uh, Last year, it was my left ankle. This year, my right ankle. It's all good, though. This was scheduled. It's routine surgery to clean up old age, (laughs) bone spurs, ligament damage, things like that. Um, Like I said, did the left ankle last year, so this year is the right ankle. So it kind of stinks because it's my right foot, my right ankle, so I'm not able to drive. But I'll be back soon enough and uh, still got a lot going on, able to do my podcast and do a lot of other things like write and got some webinars. I've been working on. As a matter of fact, I'm uh, finishing up preparing for a webinar I'm going to be doing with the IAFC and VCOS. Uh, uh, They're basing it on a chapter of my book, The Professional Volunteer Fire Department, and I have a presentation I'll be doing for them, uh, Performance, Behavior, and Appearance. And that's going to be on Tuesday, March 26th. And if you're interested in checking that out, you can just go on to IAF c.org to register you'll see uh, a tab there for conferences and events and you can scroll down from there and see all their great webinars that they have and all their great training opportunities and my uh webinar performance behavior and appearance will be on march 26 it's only about an hour or so and i'd love if you can join me and uh, because I'll be out of a cast, by, right after that, on March 30th, I'm heading off to Connecticut to do a nice four-hour session with the brothers and sisters at the Wyndham Center Fire Department in Wyndham, Connecticut, talking about all things professional. And for my New York and Pennsylvania friends, I'll be at the annual Pinsky Law Conference at the Turning Stone Resort. Um, that runs from April 4th through April 7th. And on Friday the 5th, which is my wife's birthday, so I'm bringing her with me. What a great way to spend her birthday. We're going to be at the Turning Stone Resort together. But on April 5th, I'll be presenting professionalism, passion, and pride and talking about how we should not just be professional, but we should have passion for this great fire service and to do the jobs that are required of us, whether we're a, a line officer or whether we're just a frontline firefighter, or even a scene support member in our volunteer firehouse. We should always maintain the passion to do the work. And last but not least, we should be proud. Proud proud to be in our hometown volunteer fire department and also so proud to be a member of the fire service. This is always a great conference. If you've never been and you're in the area, stop by the Pinsky Law Conference. There's a lot of great classes, a lot of great people, a lot of great networking opportunities. And that's April uh, 4th to the 7th at the Turning Stone Resort in uh, the Rome, New York area. And then I'll be going just north of Rome. Um, April 24th, I'm going to meet up with the sisters and brothers at the Floyd Fire Department, just north of Rome in the beautiful Adirondack region. And again, we'll be having a nice talk there about the Professional Volunteer Fire Department. And more after that, you can go to my website, the Professional Volunteer Fire Department.com. I have a page listing where I'm heading. And maybe if you're in the area, you can see where I'm going to be and you can come check it out if you're interested. Um, and you can stop by and, and say hello. And of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't say we're only a month away from the big show, FDIC, and I'm again looking forward to heading back to Indianapolis to recharge my batteries and to meet some friends and make new friends, which always happens at that great conference. And I'll be there all week from Sunday until Saturday. So if you want to grab a coffee or a beverage after hours, whatever it is, hit me up and uh, I'll get together and we can talk about the fire service. I love talking with the sisters and brothers. And if you can do it, I'd love it if you could come to my class on Monday, April 15th. I'll be doing a four-hour pre-conference workshop talking about building that professional culture that is so important in our firehouse. And that'll be on Monday, April 15th. And again, I'll be there all week. I'll be hosting an episode of this podcast. I'll be at the book booth for my first time ever um, selling my book. I'm not selling the book. I'll be signing my book. If you would like to get a copy of the Professional Volunteer Fire Department, I will be there. 
there. I think on Thursday right now, they have me scheduled Thursday morning. I think it was from 10 to 1130 or 1015 to 1145. Uh, Thursday morning, I'll be at the book booth. I don't think I'll have any op- their opportunities because there's so many authors that have to sign up for spots. But definitely Thursday morning, I will be at the book booth. So again, feel free to stop by the booth, stop by my class, reach out to me uh, if we if we can't cross paths there, and I'd love to hook up and talk about the fire service. But don't forget FDIC April 15th to the 20th in Indianapolis, and I really hope I can see you there. But enough about all that. Let's get on with the show. And tonight, we're going to head in a, a slightly new direction this time, something we really haven't talked about much on this show. Um, we might we might have hit on it here and there in some previous episodes, but we really haven't dedicated a whole show to this subject, and it's uh, building construction and how as professionals we should understand what we're facing when we head into battle. And as the late, legendary, iconic Francis Brannigan used to say so eloquently, the building is your enemy. Know your enemy. Now, if you don't know who Francis Brannigan is, please go look him up. And for listeners of this show who listen regularly, you know I often point out that there are certain people, certain figures in our fire service, both alive and deceased, that as a true professional, you should have an idea of who they are and what they did and what their contributions were to our fire service. And again, whether they made that impact back in the day and it still affects us today, or they're still alive and kicking, still making an impact. Either way, as professionals, we should be aware of who they are and what they have done. And Francis Brannigan dedicated his life to ensure firefighters were aware of the dangers inherent to structures on fire. And he was determined throughout his life to help firefighters understand how having a a basic building construction know-how, the features that they should be aware of, because it would help them be more successful and contribute to a safer fire scene for all. And he had a great book. It should be on every firefighter's bookshelf or in your fire house anyway, building construction for the fire service. And it's a must read for anybody that really that's in our business. But I can't have Francis Brannigan on because he passed away back in 2006. But I have another legendary building construction guru. That's my technical term because I'm not really a technical guy. This guy is, and I'm so pleased to have him on the show. And I'm pleased also to call him a friend of mine. And uh, I'm glad we were together last month month and we were talking he's like you know we should come on and talk about building construction i'm like perfect chris that's great so it's an honor to have chris nam on the show he's a his resume is long he's a technical consultant he's a niosh firefighter fatality investigator a member of that program he's a 49 year fire service veteran and he is a highly regarded national and international instructor he's an author he's a lecturer he's been a fire officer he's an authority on building science and architectural construction and how they affect fire ground operation and he's traveled extensively throughout the united states and canada and abroad delivering training programs on building performance construction and firefighting fire ground leadership command management i could go on and on and on he's the chief of training for the command institute He's a technical consultant and subject matter expert for NIOSH when they do their firefighter fatality investigations. And he's, uh, like I said, just well known across North America and beyond. And oh, yeah, he's a contributing author. He's a presenter. He hosts a podcast for fire engineer, uh, fire engineering buildings on fire, taking it to the streets. So he writes, he does keynotes, he presents, he does a lot. And I'd be very hard pressed to find a man or a guest for this podcast who has the building construction knowledge that he has combined with the volunteer fire service background, which makes him so well versed to come on our show and talk about the volunteer fire service in this very important topic. So, Chris, thank you for being here. Welcome to the show, brother. Thank you so very much. Uh, your eloquent uh, intro and uh, your very humbling uh, bio uh, was uh, more than I can take. Thank you so very much. Uh, it's a pleasure. It's a privilege to be here and uh, really just talking about the important elements that continue to drive stress and challenge the American Volunteer Fire Service. And we're touching upon 
one element that's probably the least understood, uh, the most neglected, but in my opinion, the most important when we talk about uh, fire ground operations and firefighter safety. So true. So true. did we come up with a name for this? You know, I, I thought about that as <laughs> just as I, we were we were trying to come up with a name about just building construction knowledge for the volunteer firefighter. Yeah. And uh, I gotta I gotta come up with a, a jazzy phrase for that. But before we get into that, I always like our guests to tell a little bit about themselves. So introduce yourself to the oh listeners. Gosh, well, I, I can't really follow any more than what you just mentioned. <laughs> uh, I've been in the fire service, uh, and I'll, again, I'll date myself. I started as a backstep volunteer firefighter. In 1975 in upstate New York, um, currently a retired life member of my volunteer uh, department, and that department uh, certainly set me into motion uh, literally uh, within months of, of joining. I had a tremendous mentor who, uh, at that time, I, I got involved in the volunteer fire service uh, coming right out of high school, and primarily due to the fact that uh, many of my friends uh, were members of the department in their senior year. And uh, in order to uh, hang out with the guys during the time between between uh, high school and uh, when we were going to college, um, I ended up hanging around with them, joined, and the rest is history. I mean, looking back 49 years, like a blink of an eye, but uh, I, I had a great mentor who uh, gave me some great insights. So as I got involved in the volunteer system, I was fortunate enough to uh, be going to school, going to the university to become an architect of all things. So I was learning about building construction during, during the day, fighting fires, learning about fighting fires during the evening. And on weekends, I was still going to school here, actually in my hometown in Syracuse and uh, was attending uh, Syracuse University School of Architecture. But it wasn't until my beginning of my second uh, semester, early in my freshman year, I had a great company officer who just had the right insights and just understood the big picture. And again, when we talk about professionalism, so he understood what I was uh, going into. He also could see the passion that was developing uh, very early on for the fire service. And he gave me one definitive book. And that, again, just aligns with what you just mentioned. That book was the first edition of Frank Brannigan's Building Construction for the Fire Service. So, Amazing. Um, and that book is still on my, my shelf uh, behind me. That one book, coupled with getting a clarity of the profession on the – architectural building engineering side and the fire service profession as both were developing, I quickly realized and uh, got so much clarity that that both of those aligned in such a direct manner that uh, fast forward again, almost 50 years, they continue wow. to uh, influence every single thing that I do. So that's sort of the short end of the story. I've had a lot of doors open and closed through mentorships. And I think that is such a critical component to the volunteer system. Uh, mentoring, advising, the, the, the small little sidebar conversations that we have at the kitchen table on the, on the old back step. Uh, we used to have them in, in the doghouse section of the open cab jump seats and such. I mean, whatever those communications and those exchanges are, um, I don't think you will realize until you're further away on in, in your career and in your lifespan how important those little conversations and directions and and uh, recommendations or nudges and pushes and pulls are, are going to be. And, and I owe everything to my career in a tremendous fashion to my volunteer house and to many of the leaders that uh, are still there, retired out, and many that have passed away. But uh, that that's sort of the connecting the dot. My dot was I was going to school to become an architect, which I did. Um, identify the passion for the fire service and for the job, and they continue to influence everything that I do today, which leads us to our conversation here yeah. tonight. It's amazing. You know, there again is another example of another volunteer fire department story. You know, so many guests, so many people I've met, and I'm sure you've met, started out in the volunteer fire service and it led them on this journey in life that 40, 50 years later, they're just still out there doing amazing things. And the passion for that was ignited by their service in their volunteer fire house, whether, whether they're still serving in that house or not. Years later, that impact is still there. Absolutely yeah. amazing. Yeah, it certainly is. And uh, it's funny because you mentioned architect and uh, one of our fire dispatchers, I work at the central fire alarm office and one of our dispatchers uh, graduated with uh, an architectural degree and he didn't become an architect either. He's a dispatcher. So I don't know, maybe something. 
Um, and, you know, it's interesting. Uh, the architectural profession is is something very unique. Uh, fortunately, I, I was able to practice for about 10 years uh, while, again, continuing my uh, activities as a volunteer. Got involved in academia at the same time. Uh, was uh, in charge of a community college program here in central New York. So got involved in teaching, administrating a fire science program, learning the, the, the profession on the engineering architectural side, and then just loving everything that had to do with working out of a very, very busy, progressive a volunteer fire department, which again led to other professional activities on the fire service side, engineering side, academia. Um, and again, we could talk... Uh, quite extensively on that, but it, it, it forms who we are. And I think that is so important. I, we've seen so many talented individuals coming through our doors over the decades of time, all starting off as, uh, in many instances, just a, a young recruit or a junior firefighter or an explorer and going on and having just some phenomenal careers on the career side. And again, some stories that I, we could get into are just, just phenomenal of, of who's come and gone and how we continue to pass the baton on and and, and have such a rich tradition that's based in community service and professionalism. So that's the other part of that. One of the most leading issues that influenced everything that I had been doing was a direct reflection of my one particular station, of which we had four houses, um, just the professionalism that was exhibited, that was demanded, that was expected by leadership who had that vision of what we needed to do for a very fast growing community which, you know, as we talk about here tonight, talking about that built environment and just excelling in all of the related technical aspects that one needs to achieve. And one in particular, when we talk about it, is any jurisdiction, however large or small, rural to the, to the urbanized uh, settings of a volunteer system, um, the one thing that's constant is that we have buildings, we have growth, we have decay, we have buildings that continue to get older, we have new buildings that come about, we have many buildings that undergo a tremendous degree of renovations and changes. And everything that we do on the structural fire ground has everything, absolutely everything to do with understanding that building. Absolutely. Amazing. So, Yeah, so true. And, you know, one other thing, too, um, it's this volunteer fire service is amazing for all the issues and challenges that might be out there. There's so many amazing stories in that. And, and you hit on another one, the impact of mentoring. Oh, my gosh. Good mentors in the walls of the volunteer firehouse and new young members coming in and the impact they can have on them. And years later, people like yourself are still thinking back to those early days and that impact that somebody had on them. So you do make a difference, you know, firefighters out there, when these new people come through the doors, good or bad, you make there's, a difference. There's no question on that. Here's and although this is a sidebar, I think this is an opportune time, uh, especially with your program and, and what you're doing regarding the the movement of prof professionalism within the volunteer system. So here's my little story that's a sidebar about mentoring, um, and I'll try to keep it sort of concise, but I think it's very very important because I did talk about people that come through our doors and go on to other positions down the road. So I was at FDIC a number of years back. And I'm getting myself set up, not really paying attention as the room's getting filled up. Um, and as the lights get ready to go down, I'm getting ready to, to start the program. I'm looking at the front row and I see a familiar face who I had not seen in, in many, many years. So my inside voice is saying, wow, it's great to see him. But number one, or number two is why is he here? So I didn't have any opportunity to, to delve into anything other than doing my 90 minute program, getting it all finished up finish that off. And, uh, you know, we, we, we end up embracing, giving a big hug. Hey, how you doing? Haven't seen you in years and so forth. So here's that, that story about the influence that we have and the things that we don't recognize until much later on in life. So, um, this individual, and I'll, I'll call him a kid because, and again, very affectionately. So he uh, says, Hey, Hey cap, let's uh, go uh, get a cup of coffee. And, uh, and there's a story behind the cap portion of it in terms of his term. So we, we go have a cup of coffee and start talking. And uh, so the, the story ends up going faster. He goes, look, at, I just wanted to personally uh, meet up with you and say thank you. And I'm looking around like, well, what are you talking about? He says, I wanted to personally thank you for influencing my entire career. And I'm, and I'm stopping dumbfounded. But here's the other part of that story. He goes, you know, there's five people that influenced my entire career 
in such a way that made me who I was and am today. So let's go back to the to the genesis. So this kid was a junior or explorer. He was a junior firefighter in our volunteer department. We'd be coming back from alarms, two o'clock in the morning. He'd be riding his bike up to the house, had the soap buck rec, rec bucket ready to go, ready to wash the rigs down and so forth. He was c- consistent no matter if it was 20 below zero or you know 110 out uh, temperature wise. So he, he does that for two years, turns 18, and in the state of New York, at 18, you're able to join a volunteer fire department as a full-fledged member. So I now have him as a probationary firefighter. I'm his first company officer as a young captain. I'm only in my mid to late 20s, and here's this 18-year-old. So I have him for a couple of years. He's getting some experience back in the 80s, and we're catching work and, and getting a, a, just having a great time. So he leaves, joins the Navy, does two tours during the Navy, gets released, ends up in uh, San Francisco, takes the San Francisco exam, becomes a San Francisco firefighter in a metro-sized department. Fast forward 20 years. Now we're meeting at FDIC. So this kid, this kid goes from a junior firefighter explorer to a volunteer firefighter to a metro-sized, a metro-organized organization uh, firefighter paid career and uh, ends up retiring out as an assistant fire chief in the city of San Francisco. So the individual um, just, again, thanked me as part of many others. And the story goes by this. He says, anytime things were going on at the firehouse, he says, I was always, and it was him and a couple of other guys, we were sitting in the background listening to every word that was spoken, whatever the mannerisms were, the acceptance, the denials, uh, what the debates were. Uh, how officers were handling themselves, and they were learning. We were being mentors, even though we didn't realize it. And that's what he ended up saying. He says, there were mentors all around us, and they were smart enough to realize and recognize who to listen to and who not to, and that influenced their entire career. So there's that short little snippet of you just don't recognize or realize what it is that you say, how you conduct yourselves, what the what the bars are, whether for how high or low they may be, and that you may have very influential individuals that are listening to every single word you may say that may direct them positively or negatively down the road. So just a quick little side part on that. But I'm glad um, you said well, that. That's sure that's that. that's, imp- that's huge. And yeah. what wow, that just illustrates what a difference you can make in it's the lives life. of your members, you know, people are watching, they are listening and you, in the way you behave and the way you act and the way you address people, it really makes yeah. an impact. And as I said, it's good or bad. So make it good. Remember that. Remember that. So awesome. Hey, so, okay. So building construction, I must admit, I'm not a technical guy. Um, I I love training on the engine side of things and stretching lines. And I'm a little guy, so I was never a big truckie. And I put a lot of time and effort into learning that side of the business. And of course, I'm still an EMT. I had to learn that side of the business. And I'm sure the average firefighter, the average fire officer is probably thinking, I have so many other things on my plate. There's so much other stuff I have to do. I got to do my research for my EMT or I got in New York, I got to get checked off so I can give an EpiPen to somebody or administer aspirin to somebody. Ah, there's so much going on. Now I got to worry about building construction. Why is this important? Uh, I say this, I say building construction is as fundamental to structural firefighting as water is to fire suppression. The the need for technical-based knowledge of the buildings that we are fighting fires within, that we are entering and conducting ourselves to, again, uh, benefit the the, uh, civilians that we're sworn to protect, it has everything to do with that building. But again, there's unfortunately, there's so much information, technical that we as firefighters need to be competent in or be introduced to, whether it be in the Firefighter 1001 series or the 1021 when we get out into the uh, company officer side, we unfortunately just have the ability to have sound bites of bits of pieces of information and then move on. Mm-hmm. And the reliance there is that, that the department will pick up the slack to uh, get into the more advanced beginning stages of it. In other words, if we are just looking at the introductory stages, let alone getting into intermediate or advanced levels, unfortunately, the fire service is falling very short in that. 
because as you just talked about, there's not enough time. So our priorities end up getting askewed. We, we learn enough to get by. And I, and I say this, I think this sort of early uh, bookends the, 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 the problem nationally, and I see this at, at a national level and then certainly at the state levels due to my travels, we are functionally illiterate. Hmm. We are functionally illiterate. And, how, and what does that mean? So we know enough to get by. We know enough to stretch the line and go in. We know enough how to open up uh, a building in terms of ventilation. We know enough about some basics of fire travel within the building and certain aspects of time issues and, and fire involvement and, and collapse and compromise. We know enough to get by, but not nearly enough to be literate. And yeah. that, I think, is such an important facet. We have enough information that allows us to function on the fire ground in our related capacities, whether it be as a firefighter, fire officer, and then the commander. But I think the areas that are the most grayest is between company and command levels, both the intermediate and then the true incident commander. Those gray areas continue to be just sort of left alone. We, we are expecting to pick up our experience. We pick up little tidbits of information from a podcast, from a webinar, from a conference, from some readings and so forth. And we just think we're going to get by by stretching the line and going in and just moving into this manual level of effort based upon what I believe is a grammar school level of knowledge when, in fact, we ought to be having a graduate school level of technical wow. competencies. And I that think right there how wide the gap is. And I think so, right there is one of the is one of the reasons maybe people aren't as inclined to develop the knowledge that you feel they should have because i think for several for a lot of people they get scared i think that it's they think of it like rocket science and oh, it's it, it overwhelming scares them a little bit yeah, yeah overwhelming, overwhelming is probably the right word to use i, I mean, think, think it can about be it you know when we go through training um whether we are giving training or we we've, we've been participating in training and, and both of us can go back to our early days of, of going through initial um fire Fire, f initial firefighter uh, qualifications and training, so forth. And so here's a quick note. So typically it's less than um, two to 12 hours of training that the average firefighter company officer or commander typically has. And then when we take a look at the amount of content that's out there, it's typically, you know, out of uh, 400 pages of, of uh, documentation, we're lucky if we get 24 pages worth of content that's specific to building construction. So that is part of the problem. We we do not advocate, we don't promote it up to the highest level. And yeah, we have a lot of distractions, but think of it this way. If you're going into a building, don't you want to know how that building performs? And it's something beyond the cursory. I mean, we talk about five fundamental building types, which unfortunately the fire service still struggles with identifying five basic classifications we have occupancy types, but there's a occupancy risk associated with them. And now we throw in everything that we've currently been confronted with, certainly in the last 30 years. We start looking at the late 90s, all the way in the, in, inclusive of the last 24 years in this particular uh, century. Things have so dramatically changed with construction, materials, methods, uh, how buildings are, are constructed. They're much more hybrid, which means that there's so many different things into them that it no longer falls into a prescriptive standpoint, and we're just more luckier than not. And I can attest to that just by virtue of the line of duty deaths, the near misses, the close calls, you know, being involved in some capacities there with NIOSH and, and other groups. Uh, there's just so much that ends up becoming a gap, unfortunately, at the departmental or individual or company level and organizations that really starts focusing in back on, on a lack of knowledge. So it's a challenge. And, and you just talked about it. It's it's overwhelming because it is very, very technical. If anyone has ever read Brannigan's book, any of the editions, um, it's very difficult reading. And it gets into technical things that start mirroring and moving into other areas. So you talk about architecture. Well, you talk about building instruction. Then you talk about architecture. Then you talk about engineering. Then you talk about fire dynamics and fire engineering. There's there's all of these different facets and so forth that really demands of us to have at, at the minimum some type of an intermediate level, especially at the company officer. But I'm telling you, at every single level, whether it be from the rural to the most urban volunteer setting, commanding officers need to have advanced level training in the construction that's commensurate to what you have in your district. 
So on the rule side, let's say I've got a four corners and I've got a half a dozen type three brick and joist buildings. I've got a dollar store that's down the road that's a type two fire resistive building. I've got some residential homes, some new, mostly old. You know, there's some things that simplify that world that that department can achieve and determine what's the baseline of knowledge that we need to have, where's the gap, and what do we need to drill and train upon. So that's the easy fix. Now you get into a complex urban environment where there's so many different building types with different ages and vintages and and decades of construction and so forth, all of which have so, so many unique features to them. Now it becomes overwhelming. Where do I start? Well, you start at step one, identify where you're at, develop a baseline of training, and then start filling in that gap through consistent drills and training opportunities, both internal to the department and then certainly external to that. You know, I just want to back up for one second. You mentioned that in the last 24 years you know, of, of this century, there's been some dramatic changes. What's the most dramatic change that, in your opinion, that has occurred with building construction? I think when century? we look at construction in the last 24 years, last two decades, is a continuing trend toward hybrid construction. And by hybrid, we're referring to buildings that have a variety of structural, aesthetic, engineered components and a variety of materials. So I can have a small standalone commercial building. It may have lightweight engineered construction components in there. It may have light gauge metal. It might have some concrete masonry units and a variety of other systems and components that go into it, all of which are going to react differently. They're going to give us different operational times on the fire ground. Some may lead to a compromise. Some may lead to very catastrophic structural collapse, all of which we are operating within, around, on top, or underneath those buildings. And It's a challenge. It's a challenge, number one, to identify the the predominant building construction type or material. And then the second challenge is to figure out how much time do I have to operate based upon the priorities of that incident. And that's that's part of the challenge. We do not. So here's the other big gap between what we used to have and what we currently have. Back in the day, when we talk about old school firefighting, the buildings gave us time to do what we needed to do. We weren't overly concerned about a, a, a catastrophic failure of a large square foot of floor area. We weren't worried about uh, structural integrity within the first 10 minutes. We were able to conduct ourselves relative to the mission, sometimes even without any adequacy of formal training, and do the job. Now, again, when we have these buildings that have such an engineered uh, perspective to them that just a little bit of heat, a little bit of flame impingement may start causing uh, a series of cascading events to create a very um, challenging, if not uh, um, challenging or dangerous situation. We have buildings that, again, are going to begin failing just as we're passing through the threshold and going up to the roof or entering into a compartment and stretching a line down the hallway. And we need to have that level of knowledge. We we need to have some sensitivity to it in order to figure out what we're going to do and when we're going to do it. And uh, right. it's not easy. It's certainly not now, easy. But uh, Step one is being aware that, hey, this is something that we need to do better at. We need to be more knowledgeable or I need to be more knowledgeable. And um, I was looking over some of your notes and that, um, you know, when we were going back and forth talking about the importance of this subject and you, you, something you mentioned that I, I wanted you to expand on. Um, you talk about training and critical thinking and you have a line in there, conservative bias. What do you mean by conservative bias? How does that play into being more knowledgeable about building? Well, construction? again, conservative bias is that you have to be conservative in your approach with a sensitivity of how that building is going to perform and in some type of projected uh, standpoint. In other words, I consciously need to be aware when I'm arriving on scene as a first due company officer or a first arriving uh, commanding officer or riding up as a as an acting officer in a firefighter role, let's say during the during the daytime hours when again staffing is going to be different. Um, I need to have conservative bias saying I'm not going to just stretch the line of going in. I, I need to have that little bit of a pause to size up, determine what the risks are determine what the priorities are, and then equate those back to some type of time duration, and then relate that back to company capabilities. In other words, does our skill set level and our physical and mental capabilities match up with what this building is, is giving us? So I may have a building that has civilians in distress in some interior area, either obvious or or, or not apparent, but I've got a building that's being uh, 
influenced and degraded by fire and heat and other things. I've got civilians that need attention. I've got lines that need to be stretched. Conservative bias just says I'm going to default back to a little bit of a, for better words, and I, and I hate using this, to a slightly safer posture while I assess, validate, determine what my actions are, and then move into an action mode. And sometimes those actions may be, look, if we just don't have the staffing, mutual aid's still 10 or 15 minutes out, or if it's not even coming, and I'm going to the next uh, responding department. So what's the time delay? I've got my staffing of, of X number of personnel on scene. Can I do something? Can I not do, do something? And what's my level of risk? So conservative bias, critical thinking is that you're processing this information. But the problem is, is how do I know if I don't know? You know, well, if I don't know the things that I need to be doing, we default back to what we are constantly conditioned to think about, and that's doing what? Get on scene, stretch the lines, yeah, move into a, a primary search and rescue, engage, engage, engage. And lo and behold, we're engaging, and then a roof's coming down, the floor's going, walls collapse. I mean, there's a whole cascading series of events. And fundamentally, I'll say this, every single building is predictable in terms of how it will perform under fire conditions if we have some idea of what those pieces are that I need to be looking at. And then you fall into what Gordon Graham always says, predictable is preventable. So, <laughs> very much so. Very, yeah. very much so. But predictability so, is just – it's its just knowing some key factors and uh, – We'll talk and that's a little bit more about order. order. It, it can be a tall order. I love what you say too. Um, one of your quotes I thought I read or somewhere along the line is the most important structural fire ground skill set is building construction, but it's the least focused on and least understood and the least promoted. And that it's so true. So okay. I'm Joe Volunteer Firefighter, been in my volunteer fire department for X number of years. What should I be aware of? What can I do better? How can I be better prepared? Let's take a grassroots approach here. Um, and I know, as you say, everyone looks for the quick snippets, the easy outs, the two-minute training video. But get let's wet the whistle here for getting some basic building knowledge in that. If I'm a, uh, a structural interior firefighter or even an exterior firefighter. Yeah, well, I, you know, and that's just as important. You have to have eyes and ears on the fire ground, regardless of whether you're interior or in a support capacity. Um, sometimes the support capacity is even more critical because those are the eyes that are looking at the scene looking at structural conditions, looking at subtleties of, let's say, a bulging wall or some other condition of which they can communicate that either to a company officer or command that may make the entire difference in the entire operation. So they have typically a much more global perspective if they have some insights. If they can't comprehend what they're seeing, that becomes a challenge. So they're, they're seeing, but they're not picking up on critical elements of that building. So I think first and foremost, any of our listeners can can do some things on their own because the, the challenging part is to get departments to, number one, identify and recognize that, number one, there's a gap where there's a need for, for additional training. So many departments continue to have some number of drills, typically much inadequate than, than adequate, but they'll typically have one or two drills, three, four, five, six hours worth of training annually that typically ties into a, a tactical class on strategy and tactics of which building construction may be part of it. Or maybe they're doing a little bit of pre-fire planning and they're getting some snippets of information. But fundamentally, the, the foundation of knowledge is not there. And as we continue to go further beyond our involvement in the initial training we get as recruit or probationary firefighters, we get some exposure in firefighter one and two that is just the, the building blocks of a foundation. And that's where we end it all. We end up just moving back in and start honing skill set levels in all of these other areas. So one of the things I would encourage any of our listeners to do, and it's really easily done on an individual uh, self-determined basis, is that there is a, um, an exceptional, well-developed uh, program that's available. It's a self-study program through the National Fire Academy. So if you were to go to the U.S. Fire Administration's website, go to the NFA's uh, courses, the online courses, and there is a online program. It's called Principles of Building Construction. It's a self-paced, uh, self-determined uh, online program. It's six hours of instruction, and they will cover all of the basis of what we need to establish as that foundation. So if you've never had a building construction class, that's first and foremost. If you haven't really had a formal class in many, many years, 
in terms of a drill program well beyond firefighter one or two or even uh, uh, fire officer one or two, that's a, a phenomenal free opportunity to take a class that has, uh, again, some, some good information to get you up to speed. So that certainly is a, a significant starting point from it. Um, and again, it's an underutilized uh, resource. It's free. It's something that, again, has been developed for many, many decades of time. It has been updated. So, again, it's just a matter of clicking through in the convenience of a few minutes here and there over the course of a, a cumulative level of six hours, and you'll get a certificate from the NFA. You can submit that to your department. Hopefully, they'll give you some drill credit. I would hope they would give somebody yeah. drill credit. Get it, for get it applied to uh, some, of, some of the other aspects there. So that's a starting point. Or if nothing else, you can go back to your training officer or your captain or your chief and just say, hey, look it, I just took this class online. Guess what? Maybe we ought to do this as a departmental type of activity. Everybody takes it under their own uh, self-pace. You've got a quarter, you know, two or three months to get it done. Everybody gets drill credit for it, but now you've increased uh, the proficiency and the knowledge base across the board for everyone that's taken it within the organization. So it's just a very short, easy way to do it versus having to come up with a drill schedule get the right technical individual to come in because the other challenge is that we've got some great officers out there, but when officers are trying to read a particular book, trying to find a lesson plan online to, to cover all the bases, they don't have that knowledge base and, and uh, 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 KSAs. So now they're teaching something that they very well may be teaching inaccurately. And now we end up promoting anecdotal information that continues to be spread within the fire service that's anecdotal inaccurate and there's just so much of that occurring but that's a good starting point and then the other easy fixes programs such as this the podcast the webinars uh, the availability of some exceptional programs through uh, fire engineering you take a look at some of the uh, uh, academy programs that are now are available so those and then the conferences both at the regional state and national level so but i think first and foremost take advantage of the free stuff that's out there so Underwriters Laboratory, NIST, uh, U.S. Fire Administration, National Fire Academy, um, other groups, uh, New York State Fire Chiefs, any of your state fire chief organization, your state firefighter organizations, they very well may have on their website some additional uh, resources along the lines of not just strategy and tactics, but some things on the construction side that might uh, provide some assistance. Awesome. All great resources. And again, it all starts with awareness. Hopefully we're creating some awareness today, yep, talking hopefully. about it on this podcast. And again, there's so much to be aware of. And, you know, you, I predominantly my listeners are volunteer. You're not volunteering for scouts. This is a very serious business. Not that scouts isn't something we take it seriously at all. I don't mean that, but this is a very serious business. So it begins with awareness and understanding of how important it is to gain this knowledge. And now, I'm, what do we say to the company officers? I imagine they got to take it up a notch, right? Oh, well, yeah. So typically, again, unless the department, uh, well, first and foremost, hopefully by now, we're talking about 2024, that uh, departments have initiated and embedded in their qualifications some type of standard for additional training um, beyond just, again, the basics that we attain from uh, our state levels and so forth, or the local levels, whether it be the local level, uh, being the basis for home rule, or whether we have state requirements for certification on the volunteer site. So, um, one of the first steps would be to identify minimum requirements relative to building construction in order to be able to serve as a company officer. Um, if that is not present, then again, it's incumbent, it's really incumbent upon each uh, either officer candidate or newly minted officer or an officer that's been in, in position for, for many, many years, just recognizing self-awareness. What is it that I don't know about these buildings? And just look at any of the NIOSH reports. Take a look at reports that are coming out with line of duty deaths from NIOSH. Take a look at near-miss reporting and the continuing focus on, especially when we talk about structural firefighting, building issues dealing with fire behavior or collapse, they all have to do with the building. So if we don't recognize the importance of our buildings, then maybe you shouldn't be an officer because that is how critical it is. If you're going into a building and you don't understand how that building is going to be performing, at the least you're derelict. And at the other end of it, you actually may be criminally negligent in terms of not understanding the environment, not understanding how fire travels and doing what's necessary. And I think 
although there have not been many or significant numbers of legal issues affecting the uh, the U.S. Forest Service uh, internationally, especially in the U.K., both volunteer and career firefighters are held accountable because they have a standard of training and knowledge that they both have to get either on the what they call the retained or or the career side, volunteer or the career. And if you have the minimum level of training and competencies that one has to attain, now you can help be held accountable. And they actually have had criminal proceedings for individuals who've resulted in injuries or fatalities that they've held uh, those personnel accountable. So it's it's a it's a double edged sword because if we just don't recognize that need, then I'm just going to keep on doing what I'm doing. So for our emerging company officers, those of, of our listeners who are thinking about becoming company officers, I would really just highly recommend uh, to, to start looking at some textbooks. We'll talk a little bit about some reading books and so forth here uh, as we get toward the end of the program, but there's different types of textbooks and manuals. If nothing else, start reading some of the NIOSH reports. There's a wealth of information um, in many of the reports that I've personally been involved with. We've really had an opportunity to delve into construction. Uh, there was a double line of duty death in Philadelphia in 2012, in which we were given the latitude to expand upon in that report the attributes of construction for type three construction. So common brick and joist construction all across the U.S. Uh, we felt that there was a vacuum that uh, has existed over the last maybe 20 years prior to that, that we weren't talking about that building construction type. Well, again, we took that opportunity to talk about construction, how the buildings were being built, how they reacted, how they ended up failing in this particular instance. So there's actually learnings that come out of those reports that help promote some additional knowledge and skill set level uh, for the fire service. And, you know, I'm going to say this. I say it on previous shows. My listener, my regular listeners are going to be like, oh, Merrill, you say this all the time. But it's so true. Those reports are incredible resources to use when planning in-house training drills. Yeah. And I'm sorry, but sometimes you got to put a little time and effort into planning a good firehouse drill. And it might take a little bit of work, but the resources in those NIOSH reports are incredible. Photos, videos, audio technical diagrams, all the information you need that you can pass on to your members to help them learn from a tragedy. And I know I'm right when I say this, those firefighters who were seriously hurt or killed in these studies would be glad that you're doing it because you want to prevent it from happening in your hometown. So there are lessons to be learned. Go get the lessons and dig into those resources and put a good presentation together. Maybe assign it to different officers. Absolutely. Maybe do a couple a year, however you want to do it, but do it. Uh, once a quarter. I mean, again, you can you can go to uh, to the, the newly uh, uh, promoted officer, uh, the newly minted uh, lieutenant, the most youngest lieutenant, or the most senior guys. And again, collaborate, look at opportunities. You may not have all the answers. You may be new to all the whole process of developing a, a lesson plan. There's resources out there. I think it's just a matter of identifying the need and being able to implement it in there. But uh, I, I think it's it's honor the sacrifice, honor the sacrifice made by the brothers and sisters that lost their lives and the lessons and learnings that come out of it. And in many instances, again, when we're dealing with structural firefighting activities, those lessons are born out of the building. How did the building perform? What were the good things and the bad things? How did it relate to tactics? What was the gaps that may have been there? Was there something that we didn't pick up on? And there's normally significant levels of recommendation. But unfortunately, time and time again, one of the glaring issues in there is that there is a, uh, you know, the recommendation is, you know, you need to know more about building construction. Well, here we are talking about that exact same thing. When are we going to get it? And yeah. that's part yeah. parcel to it. But. And if, I know this isn't a show on leadership or being an officer, becoming an officer, but you know what? You're also going to build your credibility as an officer because your peers are going to see that you take it seriously and you're putting the time and effort in and put on this presentation because you're concerned about them and your department. So it's a great credibility builder. That's the well, well. standard, you know. All you can right. have a so here's one of the uh, here's another little tidbit back from historical precedences in the volunteer. There was a group of us that uh, just recognizing we were hanging around. We were all in that same age group, very, very young. Uh, and again, very young officers in a, in a very busy uh, volunteer setting. We just recognized we needed to go out and take additional training beyond what was being offered 
on the county level, regional level, or even a departmental level. So getting exposure beyond the confines of your organization is, no, is number one. But more importantly, when we started recognizing and seeing some cool things, we were bringing them back and we had strength in numbers. So when there was a small handful of five or six of us that constantly were working together, uh, expressing our desires, trying to communicate and influence senior leadership saying, hey, we ought to train on this. We ought to do this. We ought to uh, be looking at that or the latest insight on something that was emerging that the department had not been keeping up with. They wanted to kick us out the door just saying, look, we, we, we've had enough. We don't want to keep changing the world. But you, if you're having that level of effort, guess what? Little by little, things start changing. Professionalism comes in. You're raising the bar. And literally, and I, and I use this sort of tongue in cheek, but literally overnight through those consistent efforts, you do start changing some things. And, and again, they, they do make a difference when you're showing up and you've got young firefighters or senior firefighters that are competent, skilled, knowledgeable, that level of confidence, guess what? That equates back to the degree of what we call aggressiveness. Aggressiveness is not doing something headstrong. Aggressiveness is that you're postured with a degree of confidence because you have knowledge, skill, putting some things together. The rest of it is grit, determination, and it defines who we are as firefighters. We get the job done. But you got to have that knowledge base to, to do it. And, and uh, again, you, you mentioned it, Tom, it's, it's, it's highly technical. And when you've got individuals who don't understand uh, terminology, there's terminology issues and all these other facets. All I can say is you've got to start, crawl a little bit, take a couple of these online programs, get a look, get a hold of any one of the uh, prominent books that are out there. So Brandon's, Brandon's book continues to be in print. Uh, Glenn Corbett is currently the uh, editor of that book, and it, it still maintains the uh, the titling of the late Frank Brannigan. So it's Brannigan's Building Construction for the Fire Service. It's authored by uh, Glenn Corbett. And again, it's there's resources online that you can obtain. There's, there's different types of PowerPoint programs, lesson plans, and so forth. But open the book and just start reading. And if you don't understand, ask the questions. You can't get the questions answered by company officers in your department. Seek out your neighboring department and just get a hold of somebody, a fire chief training officer somewhere else. Get a hold of Tom. Get a hold of me. Ask the we'll question. Be, we'll be no, don't. We'll be giving your email out later. <laughs> you know, at least you can direct and you can right. somebody can direct you to get right. the answers. Absolutely. Not every single one of us has all the answers, but we can figure out how to get them through the resources that are out there. So, uh, two books would be the building instruction uh, for the fire service. By Brannigan. The uh, other common book that's uh, very uh, common to the Forest Service is the ISTA manual on uh, building construction. Um, and again, they, they all have some things. That book is called Building Construction Related to the Fire Service, so not to be confused with Brannigan's book. But uh, I'll also take advantage of this. The, the one best book that every single volunteer firefighter, fire officer, or commander should and must have on their bookshelf is a book that I was introduced to in my second semester in college in 1976. And that continues to be a, a book that's available um, in its current edition, the 2021 edition, and that's called Building Construction Illustrated. And the author is Francis Ching, C-H-I-N-G. You can order it right now on Amazon.com. You can get an older edition for as little as $5. The newest editions for about $40 or $50.00. But it is the best non-fire service related book to understand building construction. And as the title describes, it's all illustrated, very richly illustrated to understand what a two by four is, what brick and joist construction is from the oldest to the newest hybrid construction, engineered materials and so forth. Um, it's an easy read, but that coupled with the other books that are out there are going to give you the necessary basis to do what you need to do. And Firefighter love photos. What's that? <laughs> Firefighters love photos. Well, well, they're actually graphics. They're drawing. So they're, they're not photographs. They're actually wow. very easily. Um, you don't even have to read much. Illustration. <laughs> so the definitive what? book is an officer. So, yep. What about the chief officers? Do they got to take it up even another notch or you think? So, yeah. So now the chief officers. So we talked about these particular books. Now the chief officers. Now we're getting into the heavy volumes. Now we're talking about getting a copy of the NFPA Fire Protection Handbook. The Society of Fire Protection Engineers Handbook. Those those two books are, are certainly much more technical, uh, much more expensive, but 
but that's the next tiered level. You've got to have that level of knowledge. You need to be reading and looking at the, the UL reports. Uh, and if, if nothing else, at least scanning through and taking a look at the latest studies as they relate to you know, basement fires, roof uh, uh, conditions, uh, taking a look at uh, aspects of the commercial fire ground and how fire is affecting structural components in those buildings. I mean, you've got to have that level of literacy and knowledge. And I would also venture to go out on a limb to say that if you're going to be a company uh, commanding officers on today's fire ground and you are in a suburban or urbanized environment, um, at the minimum, at the minimum, you need to have, be, have been taking a 40-hour uh, fire science class at the community college level on building construction. That, that's, that's where you've got to be. Anything less than that, you're vulnerable and you're riding the risk and uh, you may be just getting by by a lot of luck. But at some point, something very well may catch up with you. So. Yep. Awesome. You talk um, about the built environment a lot in your writings, right? I hear that term a lot, the built environment. So I want to delve into a little bit about, you know, some of the things we should be looking at um, when we're rolling up on scene or maybe when we're out pre-planning or out shopping even, and you're just looking around, what should be we aware of? Does, what do you mean when you say the built environment? So one of the things that I think uh, you and I shared a little bit is that the built environment generally speaking, continues to develop at such a fast pace that it is not keeping up with the most current methodologies and practices or tactics that the fire service uh, has been publishing or employing in, in our textbooks and even sometimes in the conversations in the uh, conference type settings. So you either have an environment that is somewhat rural and somewhat stagnant where there's not a lot of development and construction uh, a lot of older buildings, both residential, commercial, um, your, your main street type areas, or you have the dynamics in some of the suburban and, and urbanized area where there's just a lot of constant construction. And really the built environment is everything around us. It's the residential buildings, it's the industrial, it's the commercial, it's structures in which we are living, working, and uh, entering each and every day for shelter. So when we talk about the built environment, fundamentally, the built environment and building fall under five general classifications or the five fundamental types of construction. And they're classified type one through five. Um, and they, they go from the, the best to the worst. And the worst meaning is that they're more vulnerable to fire conditions versus fire resistance. So there's type one, which is considered to be fire resistive. Type two is non-combustible. Type three is brick and joist or masonry construction. Type four is heavy timber. And then type five is, is wood construction. But there goes the, 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 the challenge again. When we talk about type five wood frame construction, you can have type five construction, meaning our older balloon frame structures. You could have type five construction, meaning even older than that with brace frame constructed buildings. Or you could have type five construction with lightweight engineered uh, materials that are common from the 80s and 90s you know, a whole new type of type five construction that we currently have here in the in the uh, 2000 uh, era of time in the last two decades. So one part of it is what the codes provide for. The other part of it is the structural engineering and the architectural part. And then the third piece of it is the fire dynamics on how buildings are going to react and perform under fire conditions. So built environment just requires us to relate that back. I think in the simplest terms is what is the building's functional use? What's the occupancy? So we talk about residential occupancies. We talk about commercial occupancies or multiple occupancies. Each one of those three categories has very distinctive hazards and risks. There's different types of materials that are utilized in those buildings, and they are going to react differently under fire ground conditions that we as firefighters or officers or commanders need to have an appreciation of how fire is going to travel, how it will communicate, how it will affect the civilians, and how it will influence our strategy and tactics and decision making. The buildings and the occupancies and the materials that go into that construction influence our tactical decision making process, either at the highest level of strategic action plans and command, or at the task level of just going in through the door and accessing the building and moving through it and understanding where to open up and which fire travel may be occurring. So I think one of the simplest things when we talk about the built environment, just about Every firefighter at some point is introduced to balloon frame construction with our older residential construction. And we recognize that 
the material in those buildings uh, are, are more rigorous. In other words, the buildings have are more robust. We don't have to know a lot about them. They have some two by fours. They have voids. If a fire goes from a room and contents into the wall, it's going to be in the roof. It's going to be on another floor. We stretch the line. We go into these activities. We fundamentally learn some very basic aspects of building performance, the built environment, and we relate that back to strategy and tactics. And we've done that pretty consistently in terms of our firefighting basics of strategy, tactics, operations, and so forth. But that's where we end up, sort of end up. Uh, we never go much further beyond that. So if I talk about a residential building in the 1940s with balloon framing, that as that structure has fully dimensioned lumber in it versus a building or a residential built currently, let's say in 2015, that is built with lightweight engineer construction that has two by fours similar to what you would buy at your local Lowe's or, or Home Depot. So there's just some fundamental things that we need to be training on that now we we'll start relating back to beyond basic to intermediate to advanced level knowledge and insights. And um, with that built environment, you talk about reading the building, do you not? Isn't there yeah, something you have the four yeah. reads? Does that ex can you expand into that? So when we talk about the built environment and we relate that back to building construction, there are what I consider to be four reads or, or four things that are evaluated and sized up during the continuation of any operation. And those four reads include reading the fire ground, reading the building, reading the fire and or reading the compartment, and then reading the companies. Uh, I think reading the companies, that fourth element is something entirely new to the fire service because we don't spend anywhere near enough time talking about assessing the capabilities and the operability and the readiness of our companies. In other words, I'm, a, I'm on a daytime alarm and uh, I've got a four person staffed engine company that's arrived on scene. I'm on the incident commander. And I look at that engine company. I've got a senior guy that's the, uh, the chauffeur or the engineer, the apparatus operator. I've got a uh, very young uh, firefighter riding right front seat as an acting officer. And I've got a similar younger firefighter that's uh, riding uh, backwards in the, in the jump seat. So I've got a three-person staff uh, company, and that capability of that company is going to be very distinct based upon what I know about those three individuals versus what I might be getting on a, on a weeknight at uh, 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock at night where I've got my, my fully vested, qualified uh, fire officer, I've got uh, the designated apparatus operator, and I've got uh, maybe the same two firefighters, but I've got, I may have a different mixture in that in that company's uh, com uh, composition. That company at nighttime may be able to do things differently than the company on the daytime. So that's what that reading the company portion of it is. But just going back to the one element on reading the building, reading the building is just something that is more intermediate on sizing up the structure. Just looking at some criticalities, putting some things together that are not fundamental to the way we have traditionally sized up our buildings. Our building size up model actually goes back to 1950, 1951, in which Lloyd Lehman, who was the father of the indirect attack and the father of uh, fog stream operations, he conceived and developed the concept of, fi of size up on the fire ground. And we continue to use that today in somewhat of a, of a hybrid fashion, but it hasn't changed much. What it's done is that it continues to be somewhat inapplicable to the kinds of buildings and the time demands that we have on the fire ground. So one of the things that we've come up with with a acronym we call Building FACTS, and that FACTS is uh, First Arriving Construction Tactics and Safety, F-A-C-T-S. And that's where we've got to be thinking. We've got to be thinking upon the first arrival. We've got about a 10 or 15-minute window We've got to be sizing up the building based upon some uh, pre-incident intel, some knowledge, being able to look at the building and comprehend what I'm looking at. Is that uh, building a wood frame building? And if it is a wood frame, was it built in the 50s or was it built in the 2010 era? Um, is it likely to have raftered construction fully dimensioned or is it likely to have gusset plated uh, um, lightweight engineered construction? Each one is going to give me a different operational time. It's going to collapse and compromise if I have fire in a void in a certain time frame. So one is going to be greater. The other is going to be much less. So these are all bits and pieces that start creating a mosaic, creating a picture that we are assessing, looking at, being able to determine what we're going to do. 
A lot of good information there, Chris, a lot to digest. And we did hit on training a little bit and putting maybe some, doing some research into the NIOSH reports or the um, online class and bringing that back to your department. department. Uh, Anything else you can recommend for the uh, trainers out there? I think the first and foremost is you've got to be well-read. So if nothing else, if you've never put your hands on any of the current textbooks that are out there, we've identified three of them. There's a number of others. Uh, Vinnie Dunn, Chief Vinnie Dunn, has a, an entire series called the the uh, Battle Space, the Firefighter Battle Space. There's three books that are new, uh, more current. It's called the Firefighter Battle Space, the Battle Space, the Enemy, and then the Battle Space Combat. Those are the most newest books. But uh, Ching's book that I talked about on Building Construction Illustrated, and if nothing else, I think get a copy of the ISTA, a manual on building construction, get a copy of Brannigan's book on construction and read through it. If you're a training officer, if you're a company officer, number one, so if you're a training officer, you need to have some basis of knowledge that's technical and that's a starting point. Um, The next step, again, I would take a look at, do you have some complex building or a high risk building in your first due? Is it a commercial building? Is it a Walmart, super centers, a department store, is it a new um, garden apartment that went up? Is it an older building that's been renovated? Is it a taxpayer on Main Street that just, uh, it used to be a pizza shop and now it's some type of a, um, you know, commercial structure? Stop in and ask if you can look around. Stop in, especially under construction. If you ever see a dumpster or coming soon and you see some type of construction going on, either on your off hours or your on-service hours, Uh, as part of your drill or company, get and start asking some questions, see what's going on. I would encourage our our listeners, whether they be firefighter, especially at the firefighter level, eventually you're going to be a company officer if that's what you're looking to do. Eventually you very well may be a training officer in your organization. Start going around and look at construction. Take a look at job sites. Take a look at what's going on. Ask the question of the laborers. Ask if you can talk to the foreman and, and ask some questions. Don't be don't be overly concerned about what you don't know. Seek out that kind of information. Take your companies out and do well walkthroughs, pre, not even pre-fire plans, but just walk around job sites. I always say this, the, the, the best measure of a true professional in the volunteer setting is, uh, is an officer or a, a commanding officer that I can talk to and, I, and ask, how many job sites have you been kicked off of and how many times have you, have you been threatened to be arrested <laughs> because you've been out there taking photographs with your smartphone, getting some insights on it, and guess what? Take that information back. One of the first things I did as, a, as an early company officer, I saw some new construction, took my 35-millimeter camera, took some photographs, asked about doing a drill, and did a program on a little bit of construction, did my research, two-hour class uh, within the department. That's how you raise the bar to create professionalism and maybe start influencing those that are around you. So each and every one of you can do some things it's just a matter of having some initiative and some confidence. And I can tell you that if you fall down, pick yourself back up. If somebody, uh, you know, throws a stone out there and says, you know, kid, you don't know what you're talking about or you're inaccurate, accept the inaccuracy. It's a learning opportunity. Go back, research out. Guess what? You'll never make that mistake again. And that particular bit of information will stay with you forever because you now know it. You own it. And that's that's really part of it. So uh, for the departments that are out there, training officers, uh, just take a look at what you're committing for training on an annual basis. I would encourage you to at least on a quarterly basis, at, if nothing else, at least commit to an hour's worth of, of training once a quarter. I mean, that's minimal. Um, or at least a good solid three or six hours of training on an annual basis. And again, it may not be the drill nights. It's going to be a weekend special topic class on a Saturday or some other off night. You've got to be able to... Uh, uh, you've got to recognize the importance of the extra effort that goes into it because there will not be enough hours to cover everything that we need to cover on an annual drill schedule for training to cover all these bases. So a lot of it ends up falling back on your shoulders, developing your library of uh, books and materials, being able to go back through it. Much of it's much easier. Again, if you look over my shoulder, I mean, that's just one little small segment of a very, very large professional library that all started off with one book. And that one book beyond my Firefighter One, when I first joined the department, the second textbook that I ever bought was Brannigan's Building Instruction book. So those are the two books that are still on my shelf along with every single other edition. But that's the commitment. That's the the effort that you're going to take to be a true professional 
uh, all the way up to becoming hopefully a retired fire chief and not having anything bad happen on your watch. And that's that's part of it. Now, commitment, competency, skill sets. It may be overwhelming, but, you know, guys, it's just uh, it's one step at a time. Just, just some resources that are out there and uh, just understand what's going on and, and focus in on the big things. Then start backtracking little by little. And guess what? Over and not, none of this is going to happen overnight. Little by little over an extended period of time, it's going to start making sense. And you've got to build up on that foundation. And it, sometimes it takes an entire career. It's, it certainly doesn't happen overnight. And I can't say that it's going to happen within a couple of years. It's literally, if the longer you stay on the job, the longer, the longer you stay within the system, the, the amount of constant training, the continuing training, revisiting some things, it's just not once and done. It's a constant, continuous effort till the day you walk off the job. What if we did this? What if we gave a homework assignment right now? I'm flying by the seat of my pants here. There you go. Okay. I like that. What if we challenge the listeners right now that I'm pretty sure that in the majority of our listeners' fire districts, something is being built or renovated? There you go. So why don't you get out there and start with that? and plant the seed in your department that there building construction is something that you're going to concentrate on and take seriously and do a good pre-plan and a good t- talk or drill about a new building in your territory or something under renovation. Get out there, get out there and take pictures and talk about it. And Chris, what, what are some key things that they should be looking for? Okay, I show up at the construction site with my cell phone, camera, or whatever it is, and what am I looking for? All right, so there, there, that's a great, great lead. And so when we talk about the complexities of the, of the built environment, one of the things that we've developed a model on that applies not only to the learning side of it in terms of trying to pick up on pre-fire plans and education knowledge, trying to develop the skill set, but also translates back to the fire ground as part of our facts model it revolves around to simplify the world. So there are five fundamental, it's called the five and five. There are five fundamental aspects of all buildings, regardless of whatever, when they were built, whatever the age, the construction materials and so forth, that are consistent with what we are talking about here. And I'll, I'll go through them in a very generic standpoint. Actually, on my social media pages, um, if you go back on Facebook and some of the our buildings on fire site and such, We've done quite a bit of posting. There's quite a bit of visuals, some screenshots of some of our slides and programs that cover these in a little greater detail. And we made actually, as a result of our, of our, when the program is actually published, I will make sure I send some to you and we'll, we'll get some updated things online on social media. So here's the five and five. The five fundamental aspects of all buildings that one will look at, identify when we're pre-fire planning them or even assessing them in our size up are this identify the structural system of the building. You know, I use the term building anatomy. How is the building being built? Is it wood frame? Is it steel? Is it masonry construction? So when we talk about one of the most critical aspects, it's how that building is being built from its anatomy, the structural aspects of the building. So that's item number one. Identify the occupancy type. Identify the occupancy size. What's the volume, square footage, number of floors, and what's the level of risk? So if I have a commercial occupancy, there's going to be a risk. And what am I selling? What am I storing? What's in that particular building? So it's occupancy type, meaning is it a residential, commercial, multiple occupancy, industrial, what have you? What is the size of that particular occupancy, square footage, um, numbers of floors and so forth? And what is it that they're doing in that building? And there may be something that's very specific in that building that's isolated or it's, it's everything to do about that building. So item number two is the occupancy Uh, considerations. The third feature that one takes a look at that gets into a little bit more intermediate, what is the collapse and compromise characteristics? So if I have a newer wood frame building, it's very likely going to collapse. And if it does collapse, it's going to be very catastrophic. So lightweight construction creates a, a certain kind of collapse consideration. If it's an older building, it may be more likely to only compromise, meaning because it, it may not fully fail, it's going to fail in an isolated condition. So when we look at our buildings, the most critical part of a building under fire is how is it, how is it going to maintain its integrity? And that's what that third facet falls under is what is the characteristics for compromise and collapse? And that may require some additional insights by 
by getting help from some others that might have a better degree of, of uh, technical knowledge. But it's collapse and compromise of the structure. The fourth item is what is the methods and the materials of construction. So we talked about the occupancy. We talked about the structural systems. Well, it's the methods and the materials that went into building that building. Is it wood frame? If it is wood frame, was it nailed? Was it glued? Is it prefabricated? Is it old school construction? So how the building was built is actually characteristic of the structural anatomy. So these things all sort of fall together. And then the fifth piece of that is the fire dynamics. How will fire travel within that building? Um, will it burn the wood? Will it heat the steel? Will it expand a particular bar joist? Will it affect the uh, concrete masonry? Is it light gauge material and so forth? So how fire travels and communicates in the building are the things that we would identify. So those are the five fundamental pieces of how the building's going to be looked at from a size up, as well as a pre-fire planning or knowledge standpoint. The other five relate back to building characteristics. So I'm going to look at the following. I'm going to look at roof systems. What's my roof construction? I'm going to look at what's called perimeter walls. What's, what's enclosing the building? Is it wood? Is it siding? Is it concrete? Is it masonry? Is it tilt-up construction? So perimeter walls are the walls that enclose the building. The roof is the enclosure on that roof, and it normally is going to have some type of structure or a void. So item number one is roof. Item number two is the perimeter walls. Item number three is identifying the floor and or ceiling construction. Um, and that goes back to what the methods, the materials that went into it, how big of a floor. Is it parallel cord wood trusses? Is it a concrete deck? Is it uh, wood planking? Um, is it barn wood? Is it uh, uh, plywood? So flooring and ceiling are the critical parts of that. The fourth piece is what kind of compartment do I have? Do I have small spaces that are rooms? Do I have a combination of small or larger rooms? Are they connected by stairwells? Are they connected by uh, hallways? So that fourth piece is the characteristics of that room or compartment. And then the fifth piece is do I have voids in the building? And that's the biggest problem we end up having on the fire ground. If I have a void in a structure, that's where fire is going to communicate. There's going to be a concern regarding structural integrity. So does the building have significantly large voids in the roof? Are they small compartmentized voids, let's say in a balloon frame structure? So the absence or presence of voids in the building. So that's the five and five. And they're fundamental to every single building. So if I have an old garden apartment that was built in my particular first due back in the 1960s, early 70s, you just fill in the blanks in each one of those five and fives, and guess what? You're going to have enough insights and information to make some determinations on the fire ground, consider your tactics and operations, and if you're just pre-fire planning it, those are the most critical things that I'm going to present to talk about in a uh, training environment setting. Or if it's just something that you were going to learn, I want to look at this particular building and get some insights. Again, it's, it's overwhelming when you talk about all of the stuff that the various architectural books end up having. If you just look at those five and five, fill in the blanks, start studying them, gaining some additional insights and some particular, some additional bullets out of them, but you will be much further along in terms of your knowledge, skills, and be able to apply that on the fire ground. You know, one thing that helped me out, and I don't know if this would help any listeners out, but when I was a chief officer or an officer and new developments were going in my community, I worked very closely with our town building department. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the building inspectors is what we call them in the town where I live. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them, <laughs> coincidentally, several were firefighters, but a uh, good building construction exactly. background, very knowledgeable, very helpful. They knew what we uh, needed to be concerned with. They knew what we were looking for. So develop a relationship with your building department. And hey, as volunteers, they may even be able to do some of this good work for you and provide that information, save you a little bit of time, help write the pre-plan. Yeah. And it's uh, just something to consider. And the other thing I think that's important is as a dispatcher, I hope you have a relationship with your communication center and feed some of the important construction information to the communication center. Um, hopefully they got a pre-planned module. So if there yeah. is an incident, they can at least pass on some of the important things. Mainly a big one would be trust construction, but um, obviously where the fire department connections are, but any of the building construction uh, 
important building construction characteristics that need to be relayed to the responders. I think that's so important. Well, and again, there are many states uh, around the U.S. that have uh, placarding. Some some are local. Some don't have a statewide system, such as we do here in New York. Um, all of that came about uh, because of one particular event, uh, the Hackensack Ford exactly. fire that resulted in five line of duty deaths down in New Jersey that created a placarding system for trust roofing systems. Um, and, all, and again, even New York states, so again, if, if you're not familiar with the placarding systems in your jurisdiction, then go to your code officials and ask them to come into your drill and give you some insights on what those placards mean, where they're located, and how that relates back to operations. Again, if you're a company officer or commanding officer and you don't know what that information is, then seek out the uh, the answers. And again, I think the, the, the going to your particular uh, code officials and your authority having jurisdiction, that is phenomenal. Bring them in. They are experts in the uh, in the information. They're code enforcement officials. They are credentialed. Um, they should have that level of knowledge. And they're the ones you can ask the questions about a targeted hazard uh, or bring them in to, to, to present to the company officers as part of an officer level drill. So there's some things that you can develop Individually, it's not everybody that has to take into these things. Let's say you want to do it a, an intermediate or advanced level training class. It's all going to be company based. And, and don't think that you have to do it by yourself. Bring in the mutual aid departments and, and get that number together. Do a, a Saturday morning over a couple of weeks uh, programs, get the pizza, get the coffee and donuts and just delve into it on a larger level. Just increase yeah. that exposure of resources and don't be siloed out thinking that you've got to do it all by yourself. Uh, and you know, creating those, you know, say creating those around you. Yeah, and creating those relationships with the building department, they may be able to make it easier for you to get on site. They can talk to the, the owners, the contractors, and set up a time that's convenient and bring you in and give you the tour and and walk around and pre-plan it and have that code official with you oh, who gosh, can yeah. point these things out. So Don't be afraid to reach out to your, your local architects and engineers that are out there. Yeah, um, Go out to the, to the town or the uh, county engineers. I mean, there are different levels of professional groups, different individuals that, again, are professionals and licensed. Just go in and say, look, we're, we've got this new construction going up. Uh, we, we want some insights on some things, and uh, I'm certain. I am very, very confident that they will support the department to uh, increase that level of knowledge. And I don't know if I can put you on the spot here or not, but um, all right, we've done our pre-planning and uh, hopefully we've got a good program together. But now it's about to be 730 at night and we're toned out for a fire. Is there any quick hits you can pass on to uh, the responders about, uh, okay, you're confronted with a working fire and some things they should be cognizant of that maybe jump out right away when it comes to building construction features or i think first and foremost you've got to identify the structural systems you got to identify what's being impacted by that fire and by that being said what's keeping that building up what's keeping the roof up what's supporting the floors what's supporting the walls so fundamentally that five and five what's the roof construction what's the wall construction what's the floor construction what's the size of my compartment and do i have voids in the building those five pieces if you can answer some questions and predict with some degree of confidence, but again, it goes back to conservative bias. Predict, expect, but always be prepared for the unexpected. Well, I thought it was uh, like age metal, and guess what? It's it's uh, um, it's uh, it's an old version of uh, light lightweight engineer construction, um, or it's uh, it's a building of type three construction, and the floors have fire cuts in them, and it's and they're designed to fail. So. There's going to be some subtleties that go back to I need to have some knowledge. But if you can identify that that five uh, key elements on the arrival and, and answer some questions and have a degree of confidence uh, or pessimism, again, conservative, um, then you're going to be pretty good to be able to go and keep going. Do I remember a quote once? Was it building construction quote? Uh, what's the building telling you? Wasn't that something I learned? I think well, it was something some degree, I learned. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It, and reading the building and – uh, there's a couple of different little uh, comments that are out there, but uh, I think all in all, the, the 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 old prescriptive things that we used back in the 80s and 90s no longer are as valid. Uh, unfortunately, we're making some assumptions without thinking about other aspects to them that uh, may they may they may catch us by surprise and result in something adverse occurring. So. 
So I just wanted to read a couple quotes as we finish up here because uh, you have some great quotes. You know, I love uh, some of your your words of wisdom. Building construction is as fundamental to structural firefighting as water is to fire suppression. The most important structural fire ground skill set, the least focused and understood or promoted. Um, it has everything to do with fire ground operations. You really do hit on some great quotes to make people aware of how important it is to do uh, due diligence and pay attention to building construction. If you're going to command or tactically engage at a structure fire, you better understand the building. There is limited margin for error on today's evolving fire ground. Errors and omissions are unforgiving. Stretching and operating in a building you have no knowledge of, insights, or considerations for is dereliction, is derelict, playing you and your comp putting you and your company at risk. I could go on and on, Chris. Thank phenomenal work that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time to educate us all just a little bit. Hopefully planting the seed to go out and get more knowledge. Is there anything that you want to finish up with? Um, you gave a couple of books. Any other reading material or no, recommendations? No, I think those are uh, those are the key items. I think uh, again, I would re highly recommend uh, the Building Construction Illustrated um, as a as a really top notch uh, non fire service related book to gain some knowledge and insights on the technical side of construction. Uh, I would really highly encourage our listeners to take advantage. They have never visited a formal program of a little bit more than what they've gotten in their basic training, where however recent or however far in the past, take a look at the National Fire Academy's online principles of building construction self-study uh, program. Um, take a look at that. And then again, put your hands on any number of technical books that are out there on building construction. Uh, Brannigan's book, the IFSTA manual, Vinnie Dunn's book and series. And if you really want to get into the, into the weeds, NFPA Handbook, Society of Fire Protection Engineers, and there's many others. So a lot of good information online. One of the things that uh, I'll just make a quick little comment on, one of the things that we've learned is that it, it does start, training does formally start in the classroom. And, and as we've been talking about uh, pre-fire planning and you know going to job sites and so forth, one of the things that we recognized quite a number of years back when we conceived the idea We've actually taken the classroom into the streets, and one of the things that we are currently doing uh, across the United States is doing uh, walking tours, where we start off sometimes in a formal classroom setting for a brief couple of hours and then transition and take the classroom to the streets and do a walking tour, sizing up, looking at building, talking about things in the, in the three-dimensional built environment to develop that skill set of observations and sizing up and, and then talking about strategy, tactics, operation, collapse, and so forth. Um, and sometimes we actually do a street corner. We'll, we'll meet in a designated city at a particular street corner. We'll bring the coffee and donuts, and we literally start from the curb and just walk around these particular areas. One of the things that's coming up is we are doing sort of our, uh, our, our large-scale event, although I do these things around the United States for individual departments and communities. We've got a number of them coming up throughout the U.S., but sort of our flagship program is a walking tour in New York City. And we start off in Midtown and we end up in, uh, in lower Manhattan. We walk the streets for about uh, an eight-hour period just looking at a, a whole variety of construction types that are applicable to the smallest rural department all the way to the metro size department. And normally it's a good cadre of individuals, uh, anywhere from 20 to 30. But uh, what we do is, again, it's just it's something that you can do also. You can get your guys out there. Walk the streets, take a look at the job sites, walk the, the various neighborhoods and so forth, and take a look at those particular items. Up, oh, quick little adjustment here. <laughs> um, take advantage of what you have in your first due, your mutual. And, and again, the other part of it, don't neglect what's going on in mutual aid departments. So although we've been stressing about focusing in on your jurisdiction, your response area, also take a look at what's across those imaginary borders that you're responding to on mutual aid. They may have the target hazard that you're going to be arriving in a mutual aid greater alarm assignment that requires of you to have that same level of knowledge as the home department might have. So that sphere continues to increase uh, in a manner that goes well beyond just that that first due of your particular area. Um, and just be a student. You know, I think the most important thing, as we've been stressing right along from uh, from the first start of the program, is that the importance of that built environment of understanding your building 
if you're showing up at a, at a job, if you're showing up at a structural fire, it has everything to do with what we can or should be doing or what the public demands of us, especially when we've got civilians in distress or entrapment. We better know that building. We need to have some pre incident intel about layouts. The first time you set eyes on the building should not be when you're showing up there at 2 o'clock in the morning or 2 o'clock in the afternoon. That is just completely uncalled for in today's fire service. And you've got to have some level of knowledge of what it is that you're seeing, predicting, and putting it all together together. And then having the, the strong foundation that allows everybody to engage at the highest level of proficiency, professionalism, to do it in the least amount of time to help those that are in distress. That, that's the end of the game. We, we are sworn to protect the public. We can't save all buildings um, and just recognize that, that some buildings are really built to burn. They're going to burn down, but we have very, very narrow windows to uh, execute the mission. And if we don't execute them, as you mentioned, Tom, uh, Errors and emissions on today's fire ground are razor thin. If I screw up on the fire ground, I may not be able to recover, similar to what I could recover back in a different era of time. We could get by. The build- The buildings allowed us to do things in them in a different era, in the 80s and in the 90s. In our current era of, of building construction and the built environment, we've got to have it all together. And one of those facets to give us that, that tactical edge is understanding the construction of the building. Very good. And, uh, you know, you failed to mention yourself as a resource. So I'm sure people are going to have questions um, if they want to reach out to you. Oh, my gosh, by all means, you can social media me left and right. Uh, I always encourage my listeners, wherever I'm speaking and engaging, uh, reach out to me, cell phone numbers uh, online, uh, email address, uh, a couple of them are online. Please reach out. We can do a a, a one-on-one Zoom conversation just like we're doing here with a podcast. We can talk on the phone. I can meet you somewhere. Um, I can meet meet up with you. So, yep, I'll be at FDIC as as you will. I was going to ask. Talk about your FDIC class. So FDIC, I'm doing an a afternoon program on Monday. So I, I'm not conflicting with your class, but I'm doing a four-hour workshop dealing with the built environment, building construction, tactical risks for the first due. Uh, we also are going to be doing a live a pod and a webcast there from the four corners of FDIC on the floor. Uh, We're going to be doing a reading the building uh, unofficial off hour tour in Indy. And we've got some information forthcoming on that. One of the things that I also do is uh, a reading the building um, social media post. So each day during, uh, during FDIC, I'll be posting photographs from around Indy, putting up information similar to what we talked about here today, some insights, some links to some uh, line of duty deaths, near misses, technical information on construction. So that'll be happening each day throughout FDIC week. Um, and again, look me up, Have be more than happy to have a cup of coffee or both of us will meet up with you guys and uh, we'll have a nice little unplugged session somewhere on the streets there. But again, I do encourage my listeners, our listeners, your listeners to reach out with questions, recommendations. I have a wealth of resources uh, to put out there. They're all free. This is all part of continuing the effort, giving back to the fire service, to the job, and keeping everyone safe. And, and again, although it's an adage and it's sort of a overused term to, you know, to allow everyone to go home, sometimes not everybody does go home. And unfortunately, there are things that we can do to maybe increase that, that opportunity when we, are, when we really are confronted with some very challenging conditions and just hopefully have everything together to be able to do what's necessary. So I really encourage and look forward to talking to anybody that's reaching out so thanks awesome. for that. what is your website and how do they get what's the so, best way to get- um, so buildingsonfire.com is the sort of official website of ours okay. um, it is currently undergoing some significant makeovers we actually have uh, a couple of different websites i'll just, just throw them out so it's buildingsonfire.com readingthebuilding.com firegroundleadership.com and the fireofficer.com those are currently all going to be consolidated and the key element under buildings on fire it's going to be a primary portal to allow uh, an individual who visits the site to gain insights and figure out where to go on, on the particular topic of building instruction. So it's all about putting it together to give you the resources and information necessary. We're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, uh, Instagram. So again, just a, a quick little search on Buildings on Fire on Facebook, uh, my name on Facebook. We're on Twitter, Command Safety on Twitter, Building Constru- or Buildings on Fire on Twitter. And we're constantly posting everything on size of construction and so forth and so on. So that's my little well point. Worth I appreciate that. So, yeah. 
No, well worth it to uh, to check that out. Well worth it to attend any of Chris's classes. If you can't make FDIC, reach out to him. I know he'd love to come out to your department. And I can tell that a mutual friend of ours, um, <clears throat> that you are friends, I should say, with a mutual friend of ours, and that's Tiger Schmittendorf, yeah. because... He has so many different website addresses. I think you got to be right behind him <laughs> yeah, with all those right. websites. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. And, and actually, you know, the other thing on construction, uh, you know, take advantage of uh, fireengineering.com mm-hmm. is the podcast. Uh, we have our program, Chief Doug Klein, good colleague of ours. Uh, he and I just finished off uh, last, or actually, so let me get this straight. So when you're actually listening to this podcast, we will have already published our uh, last installment. We just completed a six-part series on the commercial fireground. So we focused in six separate podcast webcast programs on both Doug, a chief client's program, and mine on buildings on fire, and focused in on building construction, tactics, risk, operations, a whole variety of different aspects on the commercial fireground, which again, we talk about challenges. We're talking about residential, multiple occupancies. One of the other areas that continues to be a challenge for the fire service is focusing in on the construction and operational challenges of both small and complex big box, the commercial buildings. So uh, we've got a whole bunch of different programs that we've got in the archives. We've been doing podcasts and webcasts going all the way back to 2010 as pioneers uh, with that particular yeah. platform. But Vintage. Uh, yeah, fire engineering has been really good to us. We've got a lot of great programs that just take a look at the stuff, Google out the name and you'll find a, a wealth of information that you can download, listen to and get that tactical edge. So, yep. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much. Tom, for thank being you so here. much. It's thank been a pleasure. Next time I'm out your way, I will look you up. If I don't yes. see you sooner than later. We don't live um, that far away from each other. Yeah, a couple so hours. Well, again, thanks. Right. And, uh, <laughs> we'll take advantage of maybe doing an, uh, an intermediate program, uh, maybe specific to company officers uh, later this year on the construction side. Uh, but again, I think we've, if nothing else, we've, we've planted some seeds and uh, I wish you well in your continuing pursuits. You are doing phenomenal work across the board, and uh, it's it's all necessary. We are all just contributing to such a phenomenal profession that uh, just is 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 nothing to be said to say about it other than we are immersed in it at, at all levels. So thanks circle again. back to how you started. Who thought forty something years ago that it would lead to this? Right? Uh, I certainly would have. Made, would never what a journey! What yeah, a journey! It really has been. Thanks again, so brother. Up, really folks. appreciate it. Stay tight till uh, for Mark to come on. And um, just as I finish up here, again, thank you so much, Chris. If any of my listeners would like to reach out to me, please feel free. Again, my email, tamerrill63 at aol.com. Mm-hmm. And I have a professional volunteer fire department Facebook page where I'm always posting uh, news articles and links to my podcasts and articles. And um, I also have a website, the professional volunteer fire department.com Facebook. As I said, I'm on X or Twitter, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> um, the book is out there. It's doing very well. Oh, I forgot to mention this is uh, it's, I'm not saying this out of ego. I'm just so excited. I got notified last week that my book is going to a second printing. Yeah. So that means it's doing very well. If anybody wants to reach out to me for a signed copy, please shoot me an email, tamerrill63 at aol.com or contact me on Facebook, however you want to do it. I'd be honored if you wanted a copy of the book, and I'd love to sign it and get it out to you. My next show... I think will be from FDIC Live. I don't know if I'm going to have one just before that. I don't think they came out with the schedule for after this month of March. So either way, I guarantee you we're going to have another great guest, another great topic. And um, that, that's what I love to do for you all. And we're going to continue talking about this great fire service of ours. So again, thank you so much to Chris. And thank you to you for listening in. And remember always, folks, true professionalism is never defined by a paycheck. In your residence, our owed professional service delivered by professional firefighters representing a professional organization. Take care, folks. Thank you. 